all sorts of things come out and I'm, I'm finding it very hard to put it together so what tends to happen is it comes out a little bit fluidly as I go and um, if I know where everything is is then if I need it then I'll just grab it uh, so we'll see how that goes um, tonight um, as I was driving here is it echoing to everyone else because it's really echoing to me maybe I'll move this direction Is that too loud for people up the back? It's all right. I nailed Ron though <laughs> with the music stand, so that's good. Um, on the way here, <laughs> on the way here, sounds better to me, but I don't know if you guys can hear it. On the way here, I was driving behind a bus and uh, it had an advertisement on the back of the bus um, and it says, had a, had a kid uh, leaning on a table or something looking a little bit uh, unhappy um, and it said is it possible to feel smart when you've only ever been told that you're stupid and at the bottom it said we think so and it was uh, uh, Bernardo's and I was just I, I read it and went you know what it's really interesting how that kind of fits into what I want to talk about tonight um, the way in which we can be told things over and over again or we can have inherited things or we can have just work stuff out with our minds naturally uh, and sometimes it takes a lot of undoing in order to get your head around um, perhaps uh, a truth. So if a child for example out of this particular picture is being told that they're stupid and that's what they believe, it's going to take a lot of undoing to get that child to realise that stupidity is not about what you're told <laughs> um, and neither is being smart. You know, it's about what you learn. And so we learn some stuff and we get told stuff and you never know. Um, hopefully um, this is helpful to some people. I'm not planning on upturning the entire theological world. Um, but in a sense I'm uh, going on with something that I started last year. So hopefully if you received um, an email or if you checked the website, you might have done some homework beforehand. If you didn't, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to skim across it anyway. But... Uh, I'm talking a little bit more about Jesus' union with us tonight. I've called it Jesus' union with us part two. Seemed like a logical uh, extension to the last one. Um, before I go too much further, for those of you who don't know who I am, uh, my name's Steve. Um, I have been uh, coming along to these sort of events since about 1997 um, and uh, have thoroughly enjoyed, not all the time, but mostly thoroughly enjoyed having my brain changed around what I had believed up to that point uh, was causing me a lot of pain and I think God just allowed me to believe it for as long as it would take until it came unstuck. It came unstuck uh, and that was a number of years prior to that and then suddenly I started hearing things a little bit differently uh, and uh, that's in, in many ways is, is where this has led to um, with various conversations with people over the years and listening and all those sorts of things. Um, but two of the things that really uh, I, I find fascinating are uh, union or what a lot of people have come to term objective union and the other one is adoption and hopefully sometime I'll talk about adoption. Uh, it always seems to creep in a little bit when I'm speaking at whatever I'm speaking at so I imagine I'll mention it sometime tonight as well. Um, topic tonight, Jesus' union with us, um, so what and what next and hopefully that'll come out a little bit. Um, I want to look a little bit at objective union and subjective union. Now, those to a lot of people might already be going, yeah, those that doesn't, yeah, don't want to hear about big words and combinations and new words because often it's not big words; it's just different ways of saying things. Um, 
and sometimes it takes a while to hear a word and be comfortable enough with it so that you can just go on as if you know what it's talking about and you don't have to worry too much. Um, so hopefully that'll come out a little bit. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about union as part of our context for life. So hopefully that'll be useful. Um, I'll try not to say um too many times because I realise I've said that a few times and now I've got you focused on it, you will actually have the count going. Err. <laughs> no. Err is not an um. But that was. Err <laughs> drat. Uh, first of all, the last time I was here, I looked at um, three questions that I said were not new. Uh, the three questions were, who is Jesus? What has he done? And has that, or what effects has that had on us? And for me, in listening to tonight, I get to the end of it, and I probably won't say everything I'd like to say, but it always and ever comes back to those three questions. We're looking at, who is Jesus? And you may totally disagree with what I say, um, and that's great. Go for it. But it comes down to who is Jesus, what has he done, and how does that affect us? And so any argument or discussion that we have about it is great. Uh, and we'll try and bring it back to those terms so that we're not looking at our logic and all those sorts of things, but we're looking at Jesus, the Son of the Father, uh, in the relationship with the Spirit and the way that everything unfolds out of that beautiful relationship. Um, the other thing I want to do is... Um, is t- there it is again, is talk about one of the activities that we used to do at Wirraway, uh, which is one of the, uh, is a, was a climbing wall, the, the campsite, Wirraway, uh, I spoke a little bit about last time, it's a beautiful place uh, up out of Strathalban, about six and a half k's along Old Bull Creek Road, absolutely beautiful spot, uh, thousands upon thousands of kids have been up there over the years and uh, really enjoyed their time up there, I lived there for five of years of my life on two separate occasions. Uh, I met my wife there uh, and uh, there are a lot of people out there who have the same place to blame for their marital union, So, uh, which is good as well, I think. Um, one, and at the end of looking at uh, the climbing wall in particular, um, we come to a point where in order for us to see it, we need more light. Uh, what we're after in perichoresis and hopefully any other place as well regardless of where you're coming from, is that we want more light. We want to see who is Jesus, what has he done, and what have we, how has that affected us, and what changes does that make um, for us and our being every day. One of the conclusions that I came to uh, from the last talk was we went, I went through um, different areas of Jesus' life and said that and showed from a Bible verses point of view Uh, our connection to Jesus uh, in his pre-human life, in his life, in his death, his resurrection and his ascension and showed that we've actually, it's possible to see scripturally that those things have taken place. There is a union that has taken place, was always going to take place and Jesus has been fulfilled somehow in Jesus and is being opened to us through the Spirit in that our traditional, I feel like our traditional standpoint has been you are separated from God but it, by doing this and this and this or jumping through or over or round or saying certain things that suddenly there's a separation that's fixed up and somehow you are now attached to Jesus. What I did last time was pull out a whole lot of stuff and I did say that by pulling out Bible verses it doesn't prove anything. It's just the witness to Jesus in the Bible includes our union and I hadn't seen that before and it has been pulled out by several speakers over many years and so I won't, my intention is not to go through all those again but just to show that there is a possibility from the witness that we see attested to in the Bible that Jesus, through the Father, Son, Spirit through Christ have actually joined themselves to us. That was always their intention. There are different ways in which we can dress that up and, and say it but basically there is an objective union between the Father, Son, Spirit and us. We are not going to be separated from Jesus. All right? I spoke about uh, Romans 8 where a number of times, and Paul repeats it several different ways, there is no separation from the love of Christ. It doesn't matter. You can talk about high things, low things, spiritual things, things in the future, things in the past. They, they're not going to separate you from the love of Christ, from the love of the Father in Christ Jesus. 
And I said that actually, I really didn't need to speak any further. Just reading those passages were enough to explain union. Uh, the conclusion that I came to, which is not one that I made up myself, but has come out before, is that Jesus is the one in whom, by whom, for whom, and through whom all things were created, and in whom all things still persist, live, endure, move, and have their being in existence. And I've said that while we can find the Bible passages that support all those things, you're not going to know that in yourself until the Spirit reveals that to you as truth. So don't come here tonight going, great, Steve's going to sort me out because I can say great things or I can say terrible things. The Spirit is going to show you either way. The Father, Son, and Spirit are real and they are talking to us. We are not separate from them. We are united. We are in union with them through what they've done, not through what we do. They will talk. The difficulty is that we can't hear and that we can't see. And Paul talks a lot about blindness and darkness. Uh, and I'm, you know, that's all we're trying to do here is just to you know, go through those things. So we're included in his life, death, resurrection and ascension. Is it possible to be separated from Jesus? And that, to me, is one of those little bus ads on the back there that says, you know, we've been told that we've been separated for a long time. Is it actually possible to feel that we're actually in union other than by what we think we've done to get ourselves united? Um, one of the things I wanted to do, and it kind of... Mm, it's very tempting to do it anyway, if I can find it with all my pieces of paper, is that I discovered a website uh, recently called Pun of the Day. And uh, I'm a person who loves puns. I'm a father, so in that sense, like puns just come out. I don't know where. It could be genetic. Um, us dads, we do think we're funny, and we actually know we're funny. So I'm going to inflict a couple on you um, because I love puns. And I think somehow or other, they're not disconnected from the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Others would argue that they can't be. <laughs> I have a friend of mine who I'm going to dob in here, and his name is Caleb, who actually does work at Rural at the moment. And he just he uh, entered Pun of the Day uh, and was successful in achieving Pun of the Day, who then went on to Pun of the Week and is current, well, he was current uh, Pun of the Month for March. Uh, so his pun was people who plug their computer keyboards into hi-fi systems aren't idiots. That would be stereotyping. Sorry. Yes, yes. I have managed to get myself separate. No. Um, uh, the next one is probably more relevant to me speaking tonight. I used to have a fear of hurdles, but I got over it. I might pull out a few more of those just because I like it, inflicting it on people. Um, one of the activities, as I said before, at Wiraway was we had a climbing wall and it was built while I was working there, which is really cool because I got to build some of it as well um, to the extent where I got to use um, a fella's uh, very expensive cordless drill, um, about four or five times more expensive than my own, uh, and to drilling all these ripper, uh, about 10-gauge screws into all the boards that hold the faces of the climbing wall. And it was great because I was actually harnessed to the top of, the, of a 20-foot um, a shipping container, which is what we had turned up on the side, and it was all engineered and massive slabs of concrete underneath, and actually hanging off the side and drilling these things in. It was fantastic fun to be involved in. That's what I call participation. Um, but the, the climbing wall very quickly became one of my favourite activities to do, uh, became one of my favourite activities to supervise, and very quickly became one of my favourite activities for observing... Uh, human behaviour and, and kids doing this amazing activity. It, it's seemingly not terribly high, 20 foot. It sometimes looks high, particularly if you're in grade 5 or 6. Um, but for me, it didn't look that high. But what we did is set up six graduated walls on it, which also had colour-coded climbs. So in fact, there were uh, 18 different climbs on these walls. So some kid turned up who happened to be uh, lean and lithe, and could scoot up anything, well, we just said, well, sorry, you can't touch blue, you can't touch uh, red, you've only got yellow, which happened to be the smallest climbs and the furthest apart of the holds. And uh, amazingly still, there were some people who could get up. But these wall, this wall was, it just facilitated amazing activity. Uh, I loved to, to, uh, to be one of the leaders at it. Uh, there was a huge abundance of safety 
equipment built into this activity. Uh, as you can imagine, having someone fall <laughs> from 20 feet up doesn't always look good. Uh, so we did do a lot in order to make it a safe activity. And one of the things I loved to do was to run the activity during the day and then speak to the kids about it in the evening. Uh, sometimes it was half the kids will have done the activity and half would do it the next day. So they had a little bit of the benefit of the kids who'd already done it. Uh, and they would answer some of the questions that I'd ask about the safety gear and what sort of things that they noticed. But one of the questions that I would ask after I asked them to tell me all the safety equipment was, why do we use so much safety equipment? And I love to tease them a little bit with this because my answer usually was a little bit different to ones that they came up with. They, they came up with, oh, so we don't fall down. Now, there is some truth in that. We, we did use the safety equipment so they didn't fall down. The other one that classically came up was, oh, so that we don't sue you if something goes wrong. And it's just really interesting that that's the sort of um, uh, society that we're in, you know, that these kids are in grade five, six, seven, and they're coming through and they know all about getting sued for falling off stuff. So they also know things about being scared, and a lot of them act very confident until they actually start to do the climbing wall, and that was great, because it was a great leveller for some kids, and for others who looked really scared, actually got on, and it was a real time of personal growth and self-belief and all these things about their abilities, and it was great. We really did set it up so that you couldn't fail as such. Um, there were very easy climbs, and once they got hold of those, it was quite quick. A lot of them would move up. Um, but some of the safety gear involved, um, well, at the bottom of the safety, uh, those of you who have climbed before, you have someone at the bottom who is belaying you, uh, and they're often not plugged into anything. Uh, so there has to be a bit of a weight ratio thing going on. Well, we knew that in our situation up there, there may be times when the weight ratio wasn't going to work for us. So what we did was add an extra strap to each belayer, and they were plugged into a huge rock that the tractor had to bring over and put in place. So it was great fun talking with these kids and we quickly go through the safety aspects beforehand saying now you've got this huge thing and you're plugged into that and we'd go through the strap can lift up a vehicle, it was about I don't know, 2,000 kilos or something like that, this strap could pick up that was just anchoring the belayer into the rock. Uh, then we had uh, carabiners that would clip on uh, and then they had a locking device on the belay, uh, the, the belay device called a grigri and and that was great fun because you could show kids then that if I fell asleep or had a heart attack while I was doing it and let go, the thing would lock automatically and they weren't going to plummet. So that you can see some of them are sitting there going, you know, whew, you know, this is good. They've got a lot of stuff that's been built in here. Uh, we talk a bit about the wall and how it was seemingly over-engineered to the point where I'm sure you could climb your car up the wall and it still wouldn't fall down. The ropes themselves were strong enough, I think, to hold about 700 to 2,000 kilos, somewhere around, I don't know. It was pretty amazing uh, and great fun. As the kids, you could see their minds cranking over and you sit there and go, oh, I'm going to fall. And you could tell them all the safety equipment and then they'd start to climb and they'd look at you and go, am I going to fall? And I'd say, you know what, the only way you're going to know if you're going to fall is by falling. So do you want to do that before you get very high? And some of them would go, no, you know, that would actually be enough for them. They'd go, oh, no, no, that's cool. If we know that we're not going to fall, that's fine. Some of them would watch the other kids first uh, some of them uh, would just want to jump on without any safety equipment whatsoever. And of course the, the great thing is is that you could talk about that with the kids. You really could climb a lot of the climbs without any safety equipment. And people would go, oh, very impressive, and yes, you can do it, that's great. Then you would discover that if you did slip and fall down, then suddenly the fun is taken out of it for a lot of the other kids because all of a sudden there is a real danger in, mo in mob. Now, they may have the safety equipment, but I think a lot of people would be turned off quite quickly having seen someone go splat. Uh, and you know, it may put an end to that activity for the day. The answer that I would give to the kids was not so that we don't get sued. That's why we have the safety equipment. My answer wasn't so that you don't fall off, although that was, those things are both important to a large degree. The reason I said that we have all this safety equipment is so that you can enjoy what you do. And they're like, you know, their brains are sitting there going, what do you mean? And you say, well, if you know that all the safety aspects are taken care of and that you're attached, then you can climb to your heart's content and you know that even if you slip or you lose grip or you're just not strong enough or whatever happens, you're not going to go falling down and hurt yourself. You might splat into the wall and hurt your knee or, your, you know, we have a helmet so you don't hurt your head, hopefully. The list of safety stuff just went on and on and these kids would gradually go, hmm. And you could see that a number of them doing the activity would get more and more brave as they went because they 
they might underestimate their ability, so they'd do an easy one. And then I'd say, well, you know, you're a pretty good climber. Why don't you jump straight around to number four or number six or something like that? And, oh, yeah, okay. And it was great. The stuff that went on learning-wise was fantastic. But some of them got to a point where they realised that this whole climbing thing and this falling off thing was actually kind of good fun. So they would try a really hard climb where some of them you would actually have to jump to the next hold, uh, particularly if they're a little bit shorter. They're, for some of the bigger people, they had some advantages at certain points, but of course your weight power to weight ratio is not quite as good the bigger you get either. So some of these kids would actually look there and they'd, they'd look down at you and some of them would ask and some of them would just instinctively know that it didn't matter what happened. If they missed it or they got it, they weren't going to fall down. So what the heck, let's give it a shot. And so that's what they'd do. They'd climb up and wham, they'd jump up and some of them would fall down and then they'd do a panic and, oh, that's cool, I'm just hanging around. It kind of gives me a bit of a major wedgie but with a harness. But, you know, it's something you put up with as well. Sorry to mention wedgies at a meeting like this. Um, so for me, the reason that we did it, and as a leader, I felt like I had a lot of confidence in what we had I had a, some confidence in my own ability. I had some confidence in my ability to teach kids and to push them and to get them to try new things. And that confidence is something that we tried to impart on the kids as they went. Some of them needed heaps of help. Some of them needed hardly any encouragement. They just we had to encourage them to wear the safety equipment in the first place. But it was just an amazing experience to watch these kids and the discussions that you'd have about... Oh, it was awesome. And when you see some kid who, with no confidence whatsoever, makes it to the top of this wall, and the look on their face was just priceless. And I saw it so many times. There would have been multiple thousand kids that I did it with, uh, and it was, you know, really great fun. Um, to bring that, in a sense, back to union, there's some really, really obvious connections with Christ union with us and this whole climbing world thing. And I was going to try and avoid using it as an a, a illustration. But instead of using really big words, I think it's actually quite easy to look at several aspects of this climbing wall and what we did and actually start to understand what union is all about. Um, going back to the Father, Son and Spirit and their beautiful relationship, which we won't, I won't divulge hugely tonight, but you know, I said, why? Why would they join themselves to us? And I really think it just comes back to the fact that in a relationship that's working well, that's functional, it's wanting to share and open up and include. And so we've talked multiple times over the years, and you can have a look at the website, and you can have a look at the CDs and all those sorts of things to uh, open out further this relationship between the Father, Son and Spirit, and that that actually is the core and the centre and the start of everything. And I did that in that sentence with the Jesus is in whom, by whom, etc., etc., etc. All those things happened. Um, but the reason I think that Jesus is in union with us is so that some of the confidence that he has in his relationship with his Father can be imparted to us. I talked about the wall a little bit and the connection and the rope and these kids are connected. They're not going to fall off. As some of my confidence as the fella strapped into a rock at the bottom starts to wear onto and be shared with this child who's on the wall, it's amazing how they're freed up. So my goal, in a sense, wasn't to say to them, don't fear, don't fear. My goal was to tell them the truth. The kids would sit there and go, ah, it's so scary, it's so scary. And that might happen at the first step, it might happen in the middle, it might happen towards the end, it's so scary. And you sit there and you wouldn't go, no, no, it's not scary. You say, yeah, it is, it's really scary, isn't it? But have a look at all these things we've got in place and where you've got to and you've seen your friend and all these sorts of things and they'd suddenly sit there and go, mm. and you could see really the truth setting them free truth of their their union, their inclusion in all the things that was going on started to set them free for life and for enjoyment and for just the sheer um, expression of, <laughs> of just being able to go at this beautiful place in the countryside, climbing up and then look at the view at the top if that's what they wanted to do, but the triumph of getting to the top of something, knowing that they were backed up, connected, etc., and that they could try things, if they fell or felt like falling, they still weren't going to fall. They still weren't going to go splat to the ground. There were so many things in place that they're safe. And I kind of feel like there's that passage that talks about, you know, uh, you guys being evil know how to give good things to your children. Well, you know, I feel like the Father, Son, and Spirit love us way more than what we love each other uh, and way more than what we think they love us. And so I don't, I feel like 
the Father, Son, and Spirit are not going to set up a creation and then allow the you know to be somehow separated and you know not be attached to this love. I'll probably not explain that well, but I just you know how much how much more does your Father in heaven love you than what we treat and look after? I mean, with our climbing wall, there were still possibilities of things going wrong. All right, there, you know, we had the responsibility of clipping the kids on. It wasn't the kids' responsibility to clip it on. So we took responsibility for all those things. But things go wrong, you know, and it was a possibility. Pretty slim, but it was still a possibility that you could hurt yourself, for example. Um, with our union with Christ, <laughs> there's still a very big possibility of you getting hurt, not by Jesus, <laughs> but by life, by slipping, by all sorts of things that happen. And I've heard people say that, you know, in their spiritual life, they feel like they're falling. And I heard someone say a number of years ago, well, fall. You know, you feel like you're falling, fall. If Jesus is holding you up, you're not going to fall out of the arms of Jesus. Now, in some ways, that may not be something they can hear at the time. It may be, it may be something that you think, but you don't say. It depends. I've seen, I've seen it used in different ways. But in the same way that we talk to these kids and go, yeah, yeah, you, what you're doing is scary, I don't think it's inappropriate to say to people, you know, what you're doing in your life is scary. But there is an objective truth, a truth that is true regardless of how you feel about it. A little bit like that saying on the back of the bus, which is like, kind of went, oh, nice. Yeah, bus. I was a bit annoyed that there was a bus in front of me and then I read it. I went, oh, yeah, nice. That's pretty good. Um, all those things are pretty covered that I've got in front of me right there. Oh, the union thing. There are several things with objective union. Objective, it's done, it's there. You're not going to undo it. But it's very important that we understand who we're, being, who we're in union with. We've talked a bit about that. This is not an angry God who's going to smite you. This is not a drunk God. This is, you know, all those sorts of things. This is the Father, Son, and Spirit. And we open that relationship. We see that who we're connected to is pretty fabulous. I'll put that to one side. The next thing is, is that there's a union, but there needs to be a union with distinction. All right? And we've talked about that in Pericles a few times as well. If I'm in union and fusion, uh, and I was, uh, when we looked into, uh, uh, a house insurance policy recently in contents insurance the guy was saying it covers your uh, appliances for this and this and this but it doesn't cover for fusion and a fusion I gather is an engine motor thing where obviously things seize up and <coughs> that's the end of that and that, that kind of happens, bad luck we don't cover that, if your house burns down we got it, but if you have a fusion thing going on, sorry, that's just what tends to happen with electrical devices apparently uh, thankfully it hasn't happened to me yet although I shouldn't have said that um, so distinction is very important if you are in fusion. <laughs> take the climbing wall, for example. If uh, I happen to clip my climber onto the same carabiner as I am, uh, we can look at the wall and say it looks great. We can talk about it. We can look at the view. There's no way that person is going to be climbing because they're stuck to me. There has to be a distinction between myself and the climber for them to be able to be themselves and experience the wall. If Jesus has come along and that uh, idea of dropping a drop of water into a glass and it disappears and, you know, there's no longer you there. So the Father, Son, and Spirit, I mean, you only have to look at their relationship. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. And the Spirit is not the Father or the Son. They are distinct persons within the one being. In the same way is that the Father, Son, and Spirit, I don't think, are interested in fusing us together with them. They want us. They want us intact. They want us as people who can experience not only our life, but the life and the understanding that our life is included in the beautiful outflowing of the Father, Son, and Spirit's life. If we're not an individual, distinct person, what's the point? We're just little computer programs running around. And it's not separation either. And I talked a little bit about, I guess, the climbing will illustration of the separation. You know, you can do a lot of stuff separated. Sure, um, arguably, if we look through and if we're included in and through by, for, and the whole thing of Jesus, actually you can't do anything apart from Jesus. So it kind of doesn't come in. But as an illustration, you look at it and go, yeah, okay, separation, you can see some problems with that too. You know, you could say to a kid, if you can do certain things, then I will, you can connect yourself in and you can experience them in the wall. And I think Christianity is given to us a lot like that. Um, I've heard it many times. Uh, whatever it is that you need to do, it'll connect you in and off you go. 
we were saying up at Wirraway, actually, there's no choice. You're connected. You don't have to climb. Um, I mean, you know, that's obviously an option. The kids aren't forced to do it. They're not forced to go up. They're not forced to go any further than one step. But in order to do that particular activity, we include them in it and they don't have a choice. You know, they get clicked in, we check it, the whole thing. It's our responsibility. I said in life we don't choose to be born, we are alive. So the question is, is it separated from Jesus or is it not separated from Jesus? We might have to rethink it like that. Um, if we're in union with Jesus, then we can experience the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, if we're not in union, then we're stuck with either you can't be in union, you can be in union if you do something, but that, you know you have to do something. And I feel like there's a lot of religion based on that. Whatever it is that you do, you do it. Get yourself in union, then you can experience it. But I'm feeling as though there's a lot of stuff that goes on in life that can't come from anywhere apart from the Father, Son, and Spirit, whether you're a Christian or not. There seems to be an inclusion in life and might be artwork or photography or it might be loving your kids it might be cooking a cake it might be all those sorts of things I don't think they come from the devil I think the Father, Son and Spirit have created it and they impart those things to us uh, and get us to share in them what does it look like this union and that could become very quickly a religious activity as well I could say well this is what it looks like you do these things and that's what it looks like all I've put down is, from a climbing wall point of view, there are so many different options. There are kids who would look at the wall and just go, I can't do it. Um, but with some encouragement, etc., it's amazing what they could do. Uh, for all intents and purposes, any of the kids that come up on the camp have got the joy of the climbing wall. For some of them, they're going to get it before they get on, some of them it's going to take till after they get off before they can experience the joy of it. But nonetheless, it's there. Um, there are some kids who fear will grip regardless of how much talk you do. We became very creative in how we would talk to our kids um, who were up on the wall. At one point I even had to get someone else to clip into my line. I got off that, clipped into someone else's line, had to climb three quarters of the way up the climb wall, hang next to them and actually talk them through it because this kid froze. Now, for all intents, I mean, they were on the wall. It was a beautiful day. There was a lovely scenery. It was great fun. This kid could not see that. They froze. And I think that happens to us in life as well. And that doesn't mean that we're disconnected either. It may not feel that we are connected, but the Father, Son, and Spirit have not left the building. Um, one of the things that stood out to me was that I felt deep down in the recesses somewhere that there was some separation between the Father and the Son. Uh, and there is a, a writer who I won't actually mention who it is, and I won't show you the book particularly, but I'll show you a couple of little passages, just because I'm not no, no keenness to slag off. This particular writer has some incredible stuff, beautiful relational stuff. But I remember reading through this book going, oh, it's fantastic, and then some undergirding stuff came along, and I felt like it underdid everything, or undid everything. Uh, and it's talking about um, on the cross, which, of course, is where a lot of people go, yeah, this union thing, see, yeah, it comes undone because... And it says, it wasn't right that the Son of God was forced to hear the silence of God. It, I like that, forced to hear it. Now, this is the Father, Son, Spirit. If we're looking at the Father, Son, Spirit, does the Father force the Son to do anything? Interesting. Um, it seems as though, and it came out with what David spoke uh, in the last month about... Um, uh, it was a, 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 a... Glory, wasn't it? It was about glory. Uh, and he, he opened up the fact that the Father was worthy to do these things for. Now, I'd never seen it from that angle. I kind of went, oh, yeah, <laughs> well, nice. Um, but it wasn't right. It says, it wasn't right that the Son of God was forced to hear the silence. It wasn't right, but it happened. For while Jesus was on the cross, God sat on his hands. It's sounding familiar to the way that I think I was brought up. He ignored the screams of the innocence, of the innocent. He sat silent while the sins of the world were placed upon his son and did nothing while a million cries, a uh, million times bloodier than John's, echoed in the black sky, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I kind of went, oh, I feel like I've gone back a few steps just reading it. Uh, and then he went on further and talked about sitting on his hands still. And then he said, uh, where is it? Yeah. 
more or less says, oh, here we go. But when God turned his head, that was more than he could handle. And it just talks about separation. And there's, all of a sudden, there's a possibility that the son is separated from the father. So that could be true. Or it could be that interpretation of, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is in Psalm uh, 22, verse 1, and goes through. And that's known as a psalm of despair and praise. And you sit there and go, how can those two things marry together? But read through the psalm. And it starts off by saying, oh, it feels like I'm separated, but actually goes through and says, actually, praise you. <laughs> well, we're not separated. Uh, so that sort of thinking about the father. Now, if the father can separate himself from the son, then I think we actually have quite legitimate grounds for being worried ourselves. Because as other people have said, you know, if Jesus pays off the father or does whatever he has to do, um, who pays off Jesus? Then where are we... St- if that's what God's actually like and something has happened like to get us into the good books, somewhere that could come undone. Why, why wouldn't that father turn up again sometime? If we just press enough wrong buttons, we're stuffed. But Jesus actually says in uh, John uh, 16, verse uh, 31, 32, and I want to read that because this for me, when I found it, and I probably read it before, um, but when I found it, I just went, oh, it's not. Jesus is not separated because Jesus actually says he's not separated. So there you go. It says, Behold, an hour is coming and has already come. So this is uh, John 16, verse 32 and 33. Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered each to his own home and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I'm sitting there going, that to me undone a whole lot of stuff for me in my own head just hearing Jesus say that. Because now when I'm interpreting what's happening on the cross, Jesus has said he's not alone. It's going to look that way, but I'm not. The Father, Son, Spirit is intact. He does enter in. He feels our pain, no doubt. And he receives the love of the Father for us because we can't receive it ourselves. And he says, These things I've spoken to you, that in you you may have peace. Uh, In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. That was kind of, for me, it's a little bit like, these kids on the climbing wall, you know, don't fear. We've overcome the safety issues. You can climb. You can live. You're not separated from us. This is actually a fabulous situation once you learn to live in it and see what's going on. What's the time? I think 30. It's probably a good time to just about finish, isn't it? Um, I was going to make a couple of comments on universalism. Yeah. Um, Universalism, you know, it comes up, and I'm not really going to go into it very far. There have been several things. There are several things on the website to look at if you're interested in looking at why we're not into universalism with this union thing. But the two things that came to mind were these kids who are up on a wall who hate panic mode. All right, there's a real sense in which you can well and truly be included in the life of the climbing wall, but cannot see it for the life of you, and you can be, in a sense, in a hell of your own up there on the wall, stuck. Right, and there is a possibility, and I don't understand how it all works, I'm not theologically going to go into it tonight, but we're not talking about union equals getting everything and everything's fine and dandy. There's, in fact, as soon as you start writing that onto the scene, we seem to have lost the individual person again because part of union and distinction is that everybody is going to hear and see what's going on in life differently. Some of them are going to interpret the same thing in two different ways. And for some reason, sometimes it seems unfair. Why do some people get it? And some people go through agony, and yet they've heard the same thing. And yet, I wouldn't swap what I've been through in order to get to the point where I'm at. So this, I wouldn't like to have said that at the time. <laughs> but now looking back, I go, I have learnt things in a certain way. I have an appreciation for things perhaps in a way that I would never have had had I not gone through some of the trials and tribulations that I went through. Uh, And by certainly no means am I downplaying anyone's tribulations. It's awful. Uh, The other one that I heard, the other illustration, was I think from Bruce's daughter, I think it was her a few years ago, who said, you imagine a child who is being picked up by their parent who's thrown a tantrum and cannot and will not see the love of the parent for the child they are included in that family life, but they are hating it. And it seems as though that is a possibility. You can, Jesus can, the Father, Son, and Spirit, amazing, can't get better, created the world out of their love for each other and the overflowing joy. But there seems to be a possibility, and you don't have to look very far, really, 
to find that there's a possibility that, yeah, you may be in union, but you're not liking it and you're not seeing it and you're not experiencing it, perhaps. Um, so in the same way that my aim was not to tell the kids to stop fearing about the climbing wall, my aim was to tell them the truth and the truth set them free to climb and experiencing far more than what I can explain to them. I think the Father, Son and Spirit are doing the same thing. There's something going on which is huge and I can tell you about it and that's partly, I think, what our participation is about, is sharing our experiences, high, low, theological and whatever I just whacked, um, so that the Father, Son and Spirit then use that to open up stuff to us. Like reading the Bible. You can read stuff in the Bible over and over again and seemingly get none of it. And yet at times the Father, Son, Spirit can open our eyes to see things which I swear were not there before. And they're exciting. And the truth starts setting you free. And yet people can read it and not see any of that. And it's part of our participation in sharing. So the end result. There's, I guess I was going to mention subjective union, and I guess I have mentioned that. Subjective being the way that you experience the union that the Father, Son, Spirit have with us. And I've really opened that out already. So there is an objective union, there is something that you can't do, that we have been included in, that we were always going to be included in, but then there's this whole subjective side that we just don't get it. As I said, Paul talks on and on about blindness and darkness. He wants us to see, and it, the role of the Spirit is to open our eyes to see, like Paul on the road, all those sort of things, that scales taken off, all sorts of things. I had a blinds going up experience, it felt like that, when suddenly things just made a lot of sense. And that was after I was a Christian. You, know, you don't get it all in one hit. My hope is the Father, Son, Spirit love us much more than what we think that they do. Uh, and that the Spirit is always speaking to us and trying to shed life on what it is that we've been included in so that we can see our life and the hard bits and the really good bits in the light of the Father, Son, and Spirit and our inclusion in them it doesn't stop things from hurting. We had a whole discussion recently about, well, how come it doesn't stop painful things happening? Well, we seem to have this idea sometimes that as Christians, and even our gospel sometimes comes out like that, become a Christian, everything's great. Well, I suspect this room has a number of people in it who would not agree with that. However, we have seen, or we have been met by this Father, Son, Spirit, this beautiful Father, Son, Spirit, who have loved us, and somehow have, are pulling us along through these things and gradually we are seeing things. For me, I saw, I've seen things in my past now that I could never get back then. I don't wish them upon anybody, but Jesus, I don't think, ever said, come and, you know, make a decision for me and I'll go into your heart and everything's going to be great. I don't think that's in the Bible. Uh, in fact, it seems like in some cases the opposite is true. So this whole Christian life... <laughs> This sharing of the gospel thing often is unbelievable. You know, we're talking about a God who is Father, Son, and Spirit, not just God. We're talking about Jesus and his being included in his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. And we're talking about a, um, a whole creation that appears to be in Jesus somehow. And you sit there and go, yeah, well, that's totally unbelievable. And yet, I'm sitting here witnessing to you that I've, the Father, Son, and Spirit have met with me. And I'm sitting there against my better judgment saying this seems to be the truth. My prayer is, is that the Father, Son, and Spirit continue to open those things out. And as I said, probably somewhere towards the beginning, any arguments and discussions that we have are fantastic about all this stuff. But it comes back to who is Jesus, what has he done, and how has it affected us? And uh, I think that as we see these things, if these things are true and as we see them, then a lot of the stuff that we have to do, the striving, the fear, anxiety, all those things that you know you could go into for hours just talking about like this climbing wall, it's kind of an easy example of looking at different aspects. You could read heaps of different aspects of the Christian life and look at it on this wall. And it's not going to fix everything. It's not going to show everything. But it's amazing how a simple thing of enjoyment of life can open to me out a lot of truths that cut past a lot of big words that are hard sometimes to understand. And we just go, oh, is that what that means? Oh, it's kind of like that. Not exactly, but it's kind of. And it gives us a little bit of insight. And thank God that the Spirit uses the whole of life and is way more creative than what I am. So um, I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And... Uh
look forward to the rest of the evening.